so last week we started a segue into chapter 15 because we went over the body composition assessments associated with bioelectrical impedance and the skin calipers. Now, we're not at the lab, so we can't use the skin calipers to do this personally, but I thought that the lecture on skin calipers and how to do that assessment was pretty good. So hopefully we'll be able to go over the rest of the assessments of body composition that the book talks about. There's going to be some assessments of body composition that are easy to do outside of a lab. Those would be field measurements. And there will be other methods that would be more appropriate for a lab, and those would be laboratory methods. There's, I guess, also methods of measuring body composition, not many of them, actually, only one or two that I can think of, that would be direct measurements of body composition, and then others that would be indirect. Now, let's go over these terms very quickly so that we're aware of the options, because I I have to show you methods of assessing body composition as part of this course. Now we do have a lab space at Assumption, but the equipment in the lab space isn't really necessarily robust and the best equipment. We certainly don't have a hydrostatic weighing facility, nor do we have bioelectrical impedance scales or a dual x-ray absorptometry or an air displacement plethysmography pod. So to do body composition assessment in our lab wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. But it doesn't matter because there's ways of assessing body composition in the field. So rather than relying on the lab, I just adopted other assessments. And then my MO for the course became, well, if we can do body composition in the field, let's try to give you an opportunity to do these assessments outside of the lab, including a nutrition assessment, which is what you're doing for your homework assignment. And let's give you the opportunity to do this in the little duffel bag in air quotes that you bring to each of your, your clients, right? So if you just get one of those scales, then you can do your body composition and you can do it in any field or in any of your clients' rooms or houses or get your own traveling Uber body composition and nutrition job and then you can do all of your stuff without having to do a lab. The benefits of that is you have a huge reduction in the cost or the people that you have to train, right? Anytime you have a lab, there's trainers, there's people who you have to train to use the equipment in order to use dual X-ray absorptometry, right? Obviously you're gonna be using X-rays. So you can't just have the average individual start up the machine and use it. Somebody's going to have to have some training in x-ray technician stuff, right? In order to even use dual x-ray absorpt absorptometry, which is a method that we'll talk about in a little while, the person would have to get a prescription. And so there's, there's a lot to performing the lab assessments of body composition. Not only that, you need a lab space and a lab space in school is, you know, valuable. So I choose to show you field methods of assessing body composition. Now, some of the field methods that I show you are going to be indirect. None of them are going to be direct measurements of body composition. In fact, a direct measurement of body composition would mean that I'd have to like I guess, chop your body up and put it in like a test tube 
And then I'd have to spin the test tube down in a centrifuge. And you would see a percentage of your body that is fat, a percentage of your body that is water, a percentage of your body that is like whatever other material, plasma or whatever. And then you'd be able to say, all right, this percentage is this, this percentage is that, and this percentage is the amount of body fat that you have. But obviously we can't take direct me me measurements of body composition because we can't spin people down. So most of our measurements of body composition are going to be indirect. The rest of the chapter pretty much just goes over these methods of body composition. That's in the very beginning, methods of assessing body composition. And we'll talk about, mostly that's what we'll talk about today. And then maybe we'll talk about how those break down when we're trying to consider the body composition needed for a sport performance. Because when people do sport, Say, for instance, you're talking about a sumo wrestler or a football player, an offensive lineman, that person's weight needs or standards might be totally different than somebody who's a wide receiver or a running back or a midfielder in soccer or a ballerina or a gymnast. And a gymnast might want to have strength and bulk during one part of the season and not have that strength and bulk during another part of the season. So the, the chapter talks about the assessment of body composition and then what body composition is important for or relevant for certain sports. And then there's a discussion on nutrients and nutrient balance. And not only do we wanna consider carbohydrate, protein and fat, but we also wanna discuss water and minerals and vitamins and how to replace those things during workout. And what are you trying to replace during workout in the first place? Are you trying to replace hydration? or are you trying to replace electrolytes? Or are you trying to make it so that the body doesn't lose unnecessary muscle glycogen and glucose? When we assess body composition, we're assuming, and most of the assessments that we use are assuming that there's a two component body model, which means that your body is comprised of two different things. There's the portion that's fat and the portion that's not fat. Now, the portion that is fat is your adipose fat and the fat that's around your organs. The part that's not fat is bone muscle, blood, all of your cartilage, all of the water, anything else that's not fat. And the reason why this is important is because, and I'll just put et cetera, all the stuff that's not the actual fat that's around your organs or adipose fat. Or to be, to be even more fair, there's fat that's around the cell walls of all your organs and all, like all your cellular structures, all lipids and stuff. So all that stuff too. The reason why that's important is because this stuff floats on water and this stuff sinks. So this one is less dense, DB. And this is more dense than water. And one of the more valid or used methods of body composition is the hydrostatic way uses water. 
Now, let's imagine you have a boat, right? A boat, whoop, like this. This boat could weigh much more than me. Let's say this boat weighs 500 pounds. It might weigh much more than me. Or let's say it weighs 500 pounds and I have a rock here, a rock that weighs three pounds. Now, if I take the rock and I throw it into the water, then the rock is going to sink in the water, obviously. But the boat is going to float. Now, why is the boat going to float? Because the boat has is more dense, is less dense, sorry, has less density. Dang it. Undo. The boat is less dense. Has to do with its surface area. Right, if there's an increased surface area, I'm not gonna go into the exact equation, we'll probably show it to you in a second. But if, if there's an increased surface area, that helps increase the, the buoyancy of the, the structure. So it has a big surface area that interacts with the water. The rock has a small surface area, therefore it's less buoyant, it's more dense, the rock sinks. So, the stuff that's less dense is going to float on water. Therefore, if an individual has more body fat or more fat around their or organs or more adipose fat, then that individual would tend to float when they're underwater more compared to an individual that weighed the same, but that had more dense tissues like increased muscle mass increased bone density. So this two component body, I think that should say not two compartment, two component body model compares the amount of fat versus the amount of muscle that two individuals have. Now, one interesting thing is that if this is muscle, Muscle and fat are also different, not necessarily just on the density or the buoyancy of each of those materials, but also the electrical, um, uh, the electrical uh, conductance of each of those materials. Muscle is mostly water, 70% water. And because of that, muscle is able to conduct electricity much better than fat can. And so you can use electricity here because electricity is better conducted through a material that's mostly water than a material that's mostly fat. So you can use electricity to determine between muscle and fat. That's what the scale that I use does. Now, there's also a difference in the density of the materials. The density of fat is less than the density of um, bone. So you can also use x-ray and x-ray signals bounce off more dense material than less dense material. So you can use x-ray as well. So each of these methods of assessing body composition that we just mentioned using electricity or using density. These are all indirect methods. Indirect methods of assessing body composition. And each one of these are based on this two component body model, which ties in the density of the material the buoyancy of the material and the electrical conductance of the material. Because they're all assessments, they're not direct measurements, they're indirect measurements, which means they're always going to be an estimate of the actual value. They're never the real assessment of body composition. And because they're always an estimate, we have to understand there's always going to be some type of error involved in the measurement. It's never going to be exact. 
So we have to choose a, an assessment of body composition that has very little error. The assessment is very strong or close or as valid as we can do. And it's easy for us to measure in the confines of either the course or the laboratory that we have. So I'm gonna keep moving on. This next slide is an example of different ways that you could separate the body's tissues. You could think of the body's tissues as comprised of fats, proteins, carbohydrate, water, and minerals. That's looking at the body from a chemical perspective. You could separate it from an anatomical perspective where you're looking at things like muscles and organs and bone. You could look at it from the easiest perspective and the perspective that these body composition assessments are based on. There's the stuff that's fat and everything else that's not fat. And I really want to try to get my athletes to focus on this fat-free mass stuff. They get very focused on saying, how fat are you? And I think that, you know, psychologically, I don't want to bring that into the gym because there are kids who are going to be sensitive. So I try to talk about the fat-free mass or the percent muscle mass, or try to even refer to it instead of how, what's, what's the, what is your percent body fat? I'll usually try to say, what is your body composition measurement and stay away from, from just classifying them as fat or not, especially as DJ and I spoke of earlier, that the scale is not very accurate for that particular body type. So to even make those assumptions based on the values that I get from the scale, I think are not appropriate, which is why I think that the book starts to talk about here body composition and doesn't say fat percentage or anything like that. It seems as though that rather than just looking at height and weight, and if you look at body mass index, body mass index, which is a variable you'll see in many different journal articles. It's height in meters divided by weight, which is kilograms squared meters divided by kilograms squared. And this is a variable that people use as an assessment of obesity. It's not really a body composition assessment because this weight in kilograms doesn't specify whether or not the weight is mostly fat or fat-free mass. So taking measurements of height and weight or even combining these variables into a measurement such as body mass index, it's not necessarily enough to estimate or to understand an individual's fitness status. Sometimes using their body composition, not percent body fat, I don't usually use that term, but sometimes using body composition, it's a better indicator of sport performance because increased body fat is usually associated with a reduction in sport performance. So how would we assess an individual's body composition? Well, a bunch of different ways. First of all, we've already talked about bioelectrical impedance. I think it's the easiest way for me to show you how to do this. In the last lab, I've already shown you how to do the skinfold assessment for males and females. 
Now, that's not to say that I showed you the entire assessment. There are mathematical equations that you have to plug the variables into. There's a little bit more to the skinfold assessment than what I showed you on the video, but I think that, that was a pretty good start. Bioelectrical impedance is relatively easy. You can just go get yourself a scale. And many scales these days will have the ability for you to assess body composition using bioelectrical impedance. And not only that, but it will break down your, um, your body mass index. The scale that I have does percent body water, does bone mineral, mineral density, and a couple of other things too. But today what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit more about densiometry and hydrostatic weighing and dual X-ray absorptometry, as well as air displacement plethysmography. Again, before we move on, does anybody have any questions about what we're talking about? Okay. So we also, we already talked a little bit about sort of what density is, I guess. It's not exactly what density is, but if I have a boat, you know, that boat can float on water. But that boat might have a particular mass to it that is much more than, say, like this rock. And let's say I have this rock that is, you know, only weighs four pounds. This, the mass of this thing, let's say this thing is, and let's just go with kilograms just because it's a math and science course, why not? This is a thousand kilograms, right? So it's not always something that weighs more is gonna behave the same thing in water as something that weighs less. And that has a lot to do with the density, or I guess even the buoyancy, but the buoyancy of something has to do with the density of something. I don't know if they're the exact same thing. Buoyance, there's gotta be an E, buoyancy. Hopefully if I'm right, then DJ will tell me. But anyway, buoyancy. I don't think that there's an E there. I think it's just a Y, buoyancy. Boys. Oh boy, now we're causing a problem. Boy and buoyancy. Oh boy, I don't know. Let's how about this? How about this? How about this? And pretend that it never happened. So when you have somebody who's doing hydrostatic weighing, hydro is water and static, they're trying to be very, very, very still as they sit underwater and get weighed. And obviously because your body is less dense than water, if you're less dense than water, then you float, so less dense. And then if you're more dense than water, then you sink. And muscle is more dense than water, not necessarily heavier i guess because water is very very heavy but muscle is more dense than water so muscle is going to sink and fat is less dense than water so fat is going to float so the more fat that you have the more your body wants to float or the less dense you are and you're more, the more your body wants to float. And therefore, if I was to weigh you outside of the water and then weigh you inside of the water, because you have more fat, you would float more. Those individuals 
I mean, I, you could weigh you could weigh two hundred pounds outside of water, and I could weigh two hundred pounds outside of water. But when you get into water, you weigh 150 pounds. And when I'm in the water, I weigh 180 pounds. Right? That means that you have a greater percentage of fat than I have because we both weigh the same outside of water. And when we get inside of water, amount of fat that you have floats more than the amount of fat that mine does. And that would be an indicator or this difference in the weight in water versus outside of water is the variable. This is so this would give you a variable of 200 minus 150 is 50 pounds. This would give you a variable. And then you take this variable and you plug and chug into a bunch of different, a bunch of different um, equations that they give you for doing hydrostatic weighing. And then what comes from those equations is your percent body fat. So it's definitely not a direct measurement of body composition whatsoever. It is an indirect measurement that is based on the weight of the body in and out of water. And that's indirectly related to the density of an individual's body, which is indirectly based on the percentage of fat versus muscle that that person has. This is the most accurate measurement of body composition. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these densiometry chambers or a hydrostatic weighing chamber. Let's blow this up a little bit. But this individual here would go into this tank and the water temperature of the tank is measured and the water quality is maintained. You can see at the bottom, there's this little scale. And this person is submerging themselves under the water. And this scale is attached, you can see here, to some cables. And that cable is rerouted to the computer and on the computer, they get a measurement of their body weight and in and out of the water and all of the variables they need. Now, I don't know. Now, there's some benefits to this. Obviously, the benefit is that it's the most accurate. So let's go through the pros. Pros. It's the accuracy. And when I say accuracy, I guess another way of saying accuracy is validity. And the definition of validity is when a, I, it's kind of when an assessment measures that which it's supposed to measure, which I think that is a little bit of a, a little bit of a weak definition but measures, what measures what it's supposed to measure. And as far as our measurements of body composition, the gold standard or the best measurement of body composition seems to be the hydrostatic wave. It's the most valid assessment because it most accurately measures what we're trying to measure, which is body composition. So those are the pros. The pro is that it's the most accurate, but there's a couple of drawbacks to it. 
So what are the cons to using hydrostatic weighing? Well, I've, I've had a couple of fish over the last couple of years. And I've killed a lot of them. And in order for me to get my little fishbowl to be like consistent and for the fish not to die, I've had to learn how to take care of the water so that the water doesn't get algae ridden, so that the water doesn't get, um, so that the fish don't get diseases, so that the pH stays the same way. This has been very difficult. I would assume that this right here and trying to maintain this water and make sure that the water is healthy enough for a person to submerge their head in. And not only one person, but I'm assuming that if you're going to have all of this equipment, you have more than one person going into this water over and over and over. It's one of the reasons I don't want to go on a cruise because I don't want to be in the water where other people have been in the water. So to maintain the water is going to be difficult. Right. This person here is trained to use this particular equipment, so she's going to cost money. This computer costs money. This facility, the training room itself, is in a hospital or a school or some other facility, and that room itself is going to cost money. The equipment needed to maintain the pH of the water. Not only that, but this individual obviously can't be afraid of going underwater. They have to be able to submerge their whole way underwater. They obviously can't be, you know, can't have cardiovascular disease or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This individual is going to be encouraged to go underwater and blow out all of the air in his lungs because air is buoyant. So if I don't blow out all of the air in my lungs, then the air in my lungs, the residual volume or whatever is left in my lungs could float. And that could negatively impact the results of the assessment. Any of the air that is trapped between the each of these, um, these, the hair, right? That's gonna increase the buoyancy. If he was to wear a sweatshirt, then the air trapped between the threads of each of the, um, uh, then of the things that made up the, the sweatshirt would also increase buoyancy. If he ate food like beans or soda or things that would, increase the amount of air in his gastrointestinal tract that would also increase the buoyancy of his body so he'd have to be you know there would have to be a very um stringent pre-assessment um preparation that included uh normal foods he would have to come in with a particular ability to take his clothing off and perform this assessment. So there's a lot to this assessment. There's a lot that could contribute to a reduction in the internal validity of the assessment. There's a lot that could go wrong. So because we don't have this facility, because it's it would be very difficult for me to teach you how to use hydrostatic wing without this facility obviously have chosen to show you a different kind of assessment for body composition but this is the gold standard so typically what they'll do is they'll uh, do the hydrostatic wing on thousands and thousands and thousands of people and they'll get a body composition assessment for almost every body type that there is and put those values into charts. And those charts are what we compare everything else to.
So hydrostatic weighing is the most valid and probably the most widely used in terms of journal articles, in terms of body composition assessments that are used. But there's others. So DEXA uses a different methodology entirely. DEXA uses X-ray and X-ray works that more dense materials, it works on based on the density of materials. And sonar, x-ray kind of work on the same thing. Um, they send a signal, let's say this is a block of iron or something, I don't know, this is a block of material. And it sends a signal, the dual x-ray absorptometry machine, right? Let's say that this is the machine here. It'll send a signal. And the signal will go through the material and it will bounce off the material that's most dense and a material that's less dense, the signal will, will kind of like penetrate through. So you've seen all of this before. If you look at an X-ray, the X-ray looks like a skeleton, but the reason it looks like a skeleton is because the X-ray signal is traveling through all of the fat, all of the water, all of the less dense material. And the x-ray is bouncing off of all of the bone. So more dense material makes it so that the x-ray signal bounces back and Therefore, I can tell the difference between the most dense material in the body, which is bone, and other tissues which are less dense. And the most dense material would be bone and muscle and fat. So I can use x-ray technology to quantify, which means to give a number for, or a value, or to measure specifically the density of bone and the relationship of soft tissue to more dense tissue in the body. Super precise, super repeatable, especially if I have the individual prepare for the assessment correctly. But again, it's very expensive and I need the lab space. I need the equipment, the technology, the technician. I need to teach that person and it's x-ray. So they even have a dual x-ray absorptometry machine at one of the old schools that I worked at, but we could never use it because we needed to get people trained in x-ray um, technology, an x-ray technician. And the person who was gonna use the DEXA machine needed to have a prescription for it. So they got it to use for their classes so they could show the classes what DEXA was all about, but then they couldn't use it for classes anymore. So it was a big kind of waste of money. So they ended up getting an air, whoops, an air displacement plethysmography machine. And what an air displacement plethysmography means is that, like you could imagine if I had a bucket, right? And the bucket was full of water. If I took my hand and I stuck it in the bucket, right then what would happen is water would spill out of the bucket in the same volume that was my hand so air would be displaced 
in this case, instead of water spilling out of this bucket, this bod pod is this kind of big round chamber that kind of looks like this. And in the back of the chamber, there's this little collection storage area or whatever. I don't know how to explain it better than that. And there's like a little, it looks kind of like a circle here. So you can see the person sitting inside. And then there's like a hinge here. And this door here can swing open whoop, like that. And the person gets in and they sit down. And before the person sits down, they measure the amount of air that's in this little egg thing. And when they get in, there's a particular amount of air. And in the back of this person here, there's a wall. There's a wall that separates this collection chamber here with the back of this particular chamber. And there's a gasket that when the person goes in, the same amount of air that is the volume of the person leaves a gasket in the back of this little chamber and goes into this collection like chamber here. So the surface area of the person is represented by the amount of air that leaves this original egg-shaped pod and goes into this collection chamber in the back here. And now, because they have an assessment of the surface area of this person based on the displacement of air that moves from the pod into the collection chamber, they're able to determine the surface area and then therefore the density and therefore the body composition of the individual based on the two component body model. Uh, I can't tell you too much more about it, but I can tell you that Assumption College does not have one of these bod pods. So although it's relatively accurate, it's difficult to use, it's expensive. We don't have one of these machines, so I can't use it in our lab. I have to come up with some other method of assessing body composition in our lab. Now, as far as accuracy, this, this is very accurate. This is also very, very accurate. It's, they're not quite as accurate as hydrostatic weighing, but they're very useful. Now, in lab, if I was gonna show you a method to use, and I have before, oh, this is, um, sorry. This is just what a dual X-ray absorptometry is. You would have somebody here lay down, but obviously they would lay down on this table here. And the X-ray machine would send the signal and then this whole thing would be connected to the computer here that would give you your readout. And obviously there's no water here so the individual doesn't have to be afraid to be underwater but there's still x-ray signals going through the body and that has inherent issues of its own. So even though it's much easier than hydrostatic weighing they don't have to have like no clothes on. So if they're afraid of being, you know, somewhat unclothed or they don't have to be underwater, they're just laying down. There's very little preparation for this individual. They don't have to, you know, do anything in regards to 
diet preparation, not eating gassy foods and things like that, that they would have to do with do uh, with hydrostatic wings. So obviously there are benefits to this, but I, we don't have one of these machines or the carts or the lab space or the technology to use. If we did something like dual X-ray absorptometry, you would get a readout that looked something like this. And it would read the percentage of, you know, dark area here to light area. And it would give you an actual numerical value of density based on the strength of this signal in this picture that, that they got. Again, very similar to something like this. Person lays down, right? Get signal, very easy for the person to do. The other day we talked about the skinfold technique. Now, if we had the tools to do it in the lab, and if we were in the lab, I probably would show you what this assessment is. But because we don't have very good calipers in the lab and we're not in the lab anymore, it's not really helpful for me to show you how to do this. Or to make it so that our entire lab portion is based on the accuracy of how you can use these calipers. It's a field technique because I could always buy calipers or I have calipers in my bag that I could use, but the calipers I have are these plastic calipers. So even if I use them, how accurate am I gonna be? So you have some laboratory techniques for assessing body composition. And those are gonna be, in most instances, more accurate than doing a field technique. But the field technique is more, um, more remote. I can move it, it's easier for me to do. I can take my scale anywhere. I can literally do it in a field if I wanted to. So up until the last couple of years, I did skinfold as my showcased field technique for teaching body composition. For males and females, if you're gonna use the calipers on three different sites. For the males, it's the thigh, the abdomen, and the chest. And for the ladies, it is the thigh, the superiliac, and the back of the tricep. And in the last video, I showcased each one of these. Then what you do is you take the thickness in millimeters at each of the sites and you plug it into these equations. And then like Willy Wonka, what comes out is your percent body fat or your percent body composition. I would avoid saying things like, we're gonna use these pinchers or these jaws to pinch the fat on your arm and your belly and on your legs, tell you how much fat you have in your body. You know, like nobody's gonna want to perform that experiment with you. But if you say something like, my name is Dr. Young, I'm a professor in the exercise and health sciences department. Today, we're gonna to do various assessments of body composition, muscular strength, endurance, and cardiovascular fitness. We're gonna start with heart rate and blood pressure, and then we're gonna use these calipers to assess your body composition. Please have a seat. If you say things like that, then people are gonna be more likely to participate in what you want them to participate in. So once you get past, you know, hello, there's going to be an emotional component to the rest of the assessments that you're going to do in lab that you're going to be responsible for. And you have to be sensitive to that. So how you word things is going to be careful, especially when you're doing assessments at a body composition. 
Now, what I try to do in terms of like my own ability is to use body composition, uh, to use bioelectrical impedance. And for bioelectrical impedance, like I said before, I just have a little scale. And the scale has a meter here. I got it at Target. It also has these little electrodes. And the electrodes send an electrical signal through one electrode all the way up the leg of the individual and all the way back down the leg of the individual. So this person's standing on the electrode, standing on the electrode here. The electrode sends the electrical signal up the leg, all the way through the leg and back down the leg. And then it measures the strength of the signal as it comes out of the electrode compared to the strength of the signal as it comes into the electrode. And remember, fat is a good conductor. Sorry, sorry, fat free mass. Muscle is mostly water. So it's a good conductor. And fat is a poor conductor of electricity. So the more muscle mass, the more similar the signal is going to be when it comes out of the electrode into the body compared to when it comes back into the body. The electrical signal will be less impeded the more muscle mass there is. So you could have like a whole body bioelectrical impedance. You have these bioelectrical impedance scales that can be held by your hands. In this case, my athlete steps on the bioelectrical impedance scale. So most likely the electrical signal goes up one leg and down the other leg. So I guess it might not necessarily be an example of whole body, body composition. I'm not sure how my scale works, but there's others where you can hold on to one electrode in your hand. And then the other electrode is like something that's on your foot. So something that would look maybe something like this. Right, so you have an electrode on the foot and an electrode on the hand. And here's a ground, right? There's a ground and there's a ground. And the machine would, I don't know if this is the receiver or the, the, the sender, but it would send an electrical signal into the foot. It will travel all the way through the arm and the electrical signal will be picked up by a receiver here. So this was a, like a whole body bioelectrical impedance. And obviously you see the benefit of this compared to hydrostatic weighing. Well, the, the person doesn't have to be underwater. They don't have to have particular clothes on. They don't have to be uncomfortable. They don't have to, you know, breathe out all of the tidal volume. They don't have to do anything. Really. They just sit here and lay down. So obviously this is a little bit easier, but in regards to Accuracy, it's reasonable, it could be getting better. So for me, because it's reasonably accurate, it's less invasive, it's easier for me to show you in a lab that doesn't have the resources, it's just a no brainer. So what I would do is I would get yourself a scale that has bioelectrical impedance and I'm assuming the technology in the scale that I have is much better than the technology that was written about in this book, which was now a couple of years old. So these are the assessments of body composition that are introduced in the course. There's others. But we're going to focus in regards to our course, any questions that we ask on this coming exam would be focused on those particular assessments of body composition. And then after that, the course or the book starts to talk about how body composition affects sport performance. And before I, before I go into that, does anybody have any questions on 
the assessment of body composition that we just talked about. Okay. So it seems to be that there's a relationship between fat mass or fat free mass and sport performance such that increased muscle mass, which is increased actin and myosin, is going to result in an increase in power, strength, and endurance, obviously. But there's a question that my athletes are starting to have. If we're doing muscle hypertrophy, which is muscle growth, at some point, aren't they going to be too heavy to be able to do an iron cross? And it's a good question. And I have to manage that. I have to be able to explain to them how heavy is too heavy. What do we want to be doing? So even though increasing fat-free mass seems to be good for sport performance, I obviously want to be careful with the increased weight on force of body weight, especially on activities that are repetitive and require that body weight to be repetitively slammed into the ground or to be carried by somebody. I certainly don't necessarily want to have unnecessary fat because it becomes dead weight. But I don't want to eliminate fat either. Right? Fat is not something that we want to get rid of. And for the athletes in the gym, I do not want them to be 0% body fat. In fact, for some athletes like sumo wrestlers, even swimmers, and people who are putting up you know, big weight, they actually might want to have a particular amount of body fat. And not all fat is bad fat anyway. So although usually less fat results in better performance, that's not always the case. Fat is buoyant. So sometimes having a bit of fat on your body as a swimmer makes it so that you're able to float in the water better. That's not a bad thing. Or a sumo wrestler, momentum, which is resistance to stopping, which is a good thing. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So the more massive an individual is and the faster they move, the more momentum they're going to have, the less their body is going to tend to want to stop and the better offensive lineman or sumo wrestler this individual will be. So it's not always our goal to eliminate body fat. And remember, for me, for my gymnasts, their bodies are so atypical anyway that I don't even know if the values that I get on the scale are accurate anyway. So I can't really rely too much on the information that I get from the scale. So I can't really look at the amount of fat that they have or the only thing that I can do is look at their relative changes, not absolute, but relative changes. Over the course of a couple of months, how does one individual's values change using this individual's scale? It's the only thing that I can use my scale for. Relative changes over the course of time. And then I can use them to draw inferences on that one individual. Okay. 
so some of my guys are like, oh man, that guy's 15%. I'm 5%. What do I do? Am I overweight? Am I obese? Am I this? And I'm like, no, a lot of these values are misleading. Not only, not only because my athletes are so atypical, but within each sport, there's going to be different needs for different players and different functionalities. So there's, there's no real optimal body size. So I really don't want my athletes to compare with each other at all. Right. Some kids are fast twitch and slow twitch. Some of this is genetically driven. Some of this is nutritionally driven. Some of this is, it's so variable. So I try not to let my guys get so hung up on the actual numbers. Sometimes they get even, you know, so focused on them that maybe it starts giving them issues and we don't want that. And how do I present um, weight management or the collection of data in a psychologically neutral way? So I always tell the guys that you don't have to take body weight and body comp if you don't want. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to try to collect a little bit of data. So one or two of the kids doesn't do this. Um, to be able to show them the changes in body composition and their weight and make them understand the importance of what it means. Sometimes they don't lose weight and they want to but muscle weighs more than fat. So actually, I don't want them to lose weight. I want them to switch weight, you know? So to get them to understand the relationship between body weight, body composition, body mass index, and the rest of the variables and your emotional variables and heart rate and things like that, those are important because if it's just about weight, then they can get fixated on that. And that can lead to all sorts of other problems, depression, decreases in sport performance, eating, sleep disorders, mood disorders, and all that stuff. And there are some sports that even encourage weight loss to make weight. And this can be pretty destructive in regards to tissue health and emotional and psychological health. So I try to be very careful in regards to how I present body weight, body composition, why we're collecting the data. Uh, I want them to see the benefit of what they're doing. I don't want to be able to classify and judge them. It's all to show them the benefit of strength and conditioning that they're doing at an individually, you know, um, at a differentiated level. There are other problems related to weight loss, like dehydration, fatigue, eating disorders, altered menstrual cycles. So I have to be very careful with how I present nutrition to my athletes. It's, I can't talk about strength and conditioning without talking about nutrition because Nutrition provides the scaffolding and the resources for an individual to be able to put on actin and myosin and to synthesize tissue and muscle. So if you don't have the right nutrition, it's impossible. But then talking about nutrition with athletes is, you know, sometimes difficult. And not all athletes are the same and not all sports require the same percentage in body fat. Now for my athletes, I showed you that my guys were anywhere between five to 12% <coughs> body composition. Some of my guys were at about 20%, 15%. Now, if they looked at this chart 
and said, ooh, I'm at 20%, does that mean I'm obese? No, not at all. It just means that the scale, in my opinion, is probably not accurate. So to be able to talk to the athletes about the validity of the numbers and why the numbers make sense, I think that's very important. I think that these values probably make sense. It's just the values that I show my athletes on the scale don't because the scale can't account for the fact that this child is a gymnast. Now, in order to achieve optimal weight, there are so many different strategies, so many different diets. The best strategy that I can suggest based on the research that I have is a 50-30-20 split between carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So this is carbs, this is fat, this is protein. Now, if I wanna lose weight, I could lose weight very quickly by cutting off my left arm. And I'd lose about eight pounds immediately. Or I could fast altogether. And if I stop eating food, then my body's going to use my muscle mass for fuel. And then I certainly will lose weight. Or I could try to do these crash diets or keto only diets or intermittent fasting diets. We already said that the brain uses carbohydrate for fuel. So not using carbohydrate is to me, silly. Only using protein for fuel, the protein is changed to carbohydrate eventually in amino acids, results in excess water loss, and requires more energy for the body to burn protein anyway. So I don't think that's really functional. I would keep everything to a 50, 30, 20 split between carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And if you're trying to lose weight or even gain weight, you don't want to gain more than a half pound to one pound per week. So remember my exercise program with the guys to increase hypertrophy and strength and power was a 12 week long process. And if we're going to lose a half a pound to a pound a week, then they should have gained between six to 12 pounds in those 12 weeks. So if I go back and I showed you the, the weight and body composition, for the most part, my guys gained between five and seven pounds. So exactly what we predicted. And that's not luck. That's based on American College of Sports Medicine research. So I was able to manipulate the increase in fat-free mass by manipulating the strength and conditioning and the intensity and the frequency and duration, exactly what we've learned so far. Now, what you want to do is you want to base that on a 200 to 500 kilocalories per day. Now, if I take this number 500 and I multiply that by seven, 500 times seven, is equal to 3,500. And this is going to be like a pretty important number for you to remember. 3,500 milliliters per kilogram per minute. I'm even going to erase this five to seven here. Milliliters per kilogram per minute. So what this means is this equals one pound. So 
there's this conversion that 3,500 calories, right, kilocalories, this 3,500 calories is equal to one pound. So that means if I eat 3,500 kilocalories, pretty much, I'm going to gain a pound. Or if I exercise 3,500 milliliters per kilogram per minute more than I eat, I'm going to lose a pound. So let's say, for instance, you're eating 200, uh, sorry, 2,000. 2,000 calories a day. And you're exercising 2,000 calories a day. And by exercising, I mean all of your activities of daily living and all of the strength and conditioning that you're doing and everything that you're doing is equal to 2,000 calories. So all of the exercise, all of your acti activities of daily living require 2,000 calories and you're only eating 2,000 calories. You're not gonna add, you're not gonna gain muscle mass. The exercise that you're doing is only being complemented, only, only just being complemented by the resources that you're putting into your body. So your body is going to maintain body weight. Now, if you want to increase muscle mass, you want to increase fat free mass, then what you want to do is, I know this is a caloric deficit, but right now we're going to talk about increasing the amount of exercise or the relationship between exercise and eating by 500 calories. Right now, 2,000 minus 2,000 equals zero. But let's say I start exercising and I exercise another 250 calories. So I exercise 250 calories more of exercise. And then that week on top of that, I increase the amount that I eat healthily by another 250 calories split between this percentage. Well, that's 250 calories in and 250 calories out. And that's a deficit of 500 calories a day, which means that week, what I'm going to do is put on one kilogram because 500 times seven days in that week is 3,500 kilocalorie difference. So I'll put on a pound. That's usually how things work. If I want to lose weight, then what I would do is let's say here, let's erase this a little bit. If I want to lose weight, then what I wanna do is exercise instead of 2000 calories and eating 2000 calories. If I exercised 2000, sorry, if I added, erase, if I added 500 calories of exercise over the course of the week, I would be spending 2,500 calories and eating 2,000 calories, there would be a 500 calorie deficit. And therefore, I would lose over the course of the week 500 times seven. I would lose one pound. That's sort of the how if I was going to open a company and work on weight management, those are the values and the numbers that I would use as my cornerstone for pretty much 
my my not theology but my um my methodology for each of my 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 clients Athletes who are wanting to try and gain weight in season need to target the kinds of goals they have. Presumably they're trying to gain lean mass and so they need to do the right kind of training and then they need to increase their energy intake and protein spread over the day to help with the adaptation. Finding ways to increase calories is about trying to find foods that have got more calories per mouthful and trying to reduce the things that you might have in your diet that don't provide that nutritional value. Trying to have more meals and snacks over the day so there's more opportunities is a good idea. And sometimes that's a lifestyle management thing, just making sure that you've thought ahead to have the room, the, the food, particularly around your training sessions so that you're eating before, during, and recovering afterwards and um, filling up the rest of the day with, with times that you can eat nutritious, high-energy snacks. Um, athletes who need to try and lose weight are usually trying to lose body fat and that's a matter of reducing calorie intake and again it's a matter of changing the food choice trying to find foods that are filling and that have less calories per mouthful um, so trying to find nutritious foods that can keep you full but reduce energy intake without making it feel like a sacrifice So again, we've spoken about this breakdown of calories, and you'll notice that it's for athletes about 50% carbohydrate, 35% fat, and 10 to 15% protein. Usually the breakdown, like I wrote on the previous slide, is about 50, 30, 20 split between carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Remember, protein, you don't have to stockpile because your body doesn't want to store it. it. Just gets rid of excess protein or uses it as fuel anyway. Carbohydrate is gasoline. So for the most part, you want to have about 50% of your, your diet is carbohydrate. If you're an endurance runner, you want to increase that a little bit more. That's why it's 55 to 60% here. And now also remember that most people are inactive each day. A lot of people have jobs that are sitting in cubicles behind a computer, not active for 12 hours a day. So if this was a class on not exercise physiology, but public health physiology, Maybe we might want to consider managing these carbs or getting people to understand the difference between high and low glycemic index carbohydrates. So for an athlete, their carb intake, especially given the intensity and duration of the exercise, might want to be a little bit high. So if I'm at 3,000 calories, then I want to have about 1,500 of those calories is going to be from carbohydrate, maybe even a bit more, 1,500 calories. I'll show you what that means in a bit. And then about 1,000 calories are going to be from fat. Now, that's not exactly correct, but it's close enough. And 500 calories from protein. So that's the breakdown. And then in a couple of slides, I'll show you what 1,500 calories of carbohydrate means and what that means, but it's not a lot. All right, remember, these are calories, and each gram has four calories. So this is going to be divided by four, and that will give you how many grams. This is going to be divided by nine, and that will give you how many grams. And this is going to be divided by four. So 500 divided by four is about 125 equals. So 125 grams of protein really isn't that much. It's about three chicken breasts. It's about two cans of tuna. 
1500 divided by four is about, hold on. 1500 divided by four equals 375. And there's about a hundred calories in a bag of brown rice. So you have to have about three bags of brown rice, three or four bags of brown rice. Anyway, a lot of this is based on how big your body is, how much muscle mass your body has. Everything's based on this muscle mass because remember, I'm gonna erase that. And, and a lot of that is based on this, remember, resting metabolic, rate or the amount of energy that I spend when I'm doing nothing is equal to 500 plus 22, whoopsies, this, this should be erased. That is erased, 500 plus 22 times your fat-free mass. So this is like one of my most important equations because what it does is it equates the amount of muscle mass, the amount of fat-free mass here with the amount of energy that you spend on a daily basis. This tells me if I want to lose weight, if I want to spend more energy, don't get on a treadmill. Start doing strength and conditioning and increase my fat-free mass. Because if I have more body mass, I burn more carbohydrate and protein because I have more muscle mass for those nutrients to be utilized by. In any event, the most amount of protein that you should have based on your body weight goals or training goals is 1.7 grams of protein per carbohydrate, uh, per kilogram body weight. So I'm 65 kilograms. Multiply that by 1.7. That's 110.5 grams. So if I'm putting on massive amounts of muscle, the most I want to be taken in is 110.5 grams of protein. And I'll show you what that means, but it's not a lot. And 12 grams per kilogram body weight, 65 times 12 equals 780 grams of carbohydrate, right? Now grams, multiply grams by four, that's 3,120 calories of carbohydrate, 3,120 grams. So that's calories of carbohydrate. Remember, you're gonna multiply grams by four to get the amount of calories and carbohydrate. So this says that at most, if I'm trying to house food and make as much muscle as I can, at most, I want 110.5 um, 110.5 grams of protein and 110.5 multiplied by a, multiplied by four is, hold on, 110.5 multiplied by four. It's 442 calories. 442 of these calories at most should be protein. And then 3,120 calories at most should be carbohydrate. These values are easily attainable with the American diet. So actually my, my advice to people who are trying to manage diet and do sport, you don't really have to change too much. Um, you want to take a look at the current standards or your daily recommended intake. But again, some of these values are going to be based on standards that are not similar to what an athlete should be taking in. Current standards are based on the regular person and the regular person is based on a 2000 calorie diet, but I would bet that the guys in my gym are burning 3,500 calories, a completely, totally atypical diet. 
So for exercise physiology and for nutrition, for sport performance, I would probably say that I want to shy away from these allowances and more take into account the, the needs of each of the, the sports and the positions within each sport that we're kind of talking about. I think that this is probably a good spot to stop for the day, to be totally honest with you. We have to start getting into the types of nutrients, and I think it's a completely different topic of conversation, and I don't want to stop halfway through. So if it's okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the share.